So in uh, recent days we've been speaking uh, about the Eucharist, our, our, our readings have been about the Eucharist, uh, often focusing on the miracle of the multiplication of the loaves and fish in which we see uh, a young boy presenting his five loaves and his two fish and the Lord then taking the seemingly insignificant gift right, for 5,000 men plus women and children, so who knows, maybe seven, 8,000, 9,000 people, five loaves and two fish would feed one big burly man, right? Uh, but like, it's not going to feed a crowd. It's, you know, it's, 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 it's hardly even worth speaking about. You know, you need a truckload of food, not, not a handbag full. So this guy presents his, the little that he has. And the Lord is the great magnifier. The Lord takes the little we have and adds all of his grace, all of his power, and then voila, miracle. Uh, we see something like this in the life of St. John Vianney as well, who, and this is, it's again, very consoling and very comforting when you read about a saint who didn't have it all right, as in, in the sense that academically, uh, our little Jean-Marie found it very tough. So basically his Latin was rubbish. Uh, so when he was studying, he just couldn't get his head around Latin. He was fairly bad at philosophy too. So just abstract thoughts and kind of, you know, you know people who, whenever they hear a foreign language, they go, that's, that's stupid just can't understand that someone else could have an, an, a different word for what we have. I mean, what, of course it's called bread. Why would you call it broat? That's just stupid. It's, it's called bread. Anyway, so, so people, people find it difficult to just imagine a foreign language and to speak in a foreign language or to, or to think in abstract thought like in philosophy. So he, he found his studies tough. He found his studies very, very difficult. And um, this was the end of the 18th century. So he was born in 1786. So... Uh, the French Revolution was about to kick in. Na uh, Napoleon was was declaring war here, there, and everywhere. And uh, he actually got Jean Marie got got drafted into into the army. Apparently, when the platoon was leaving, Jean Marie went to the chapel to pray and missed the, the departure of his platoon. Strictly speaking, you're called a deserter, even though you haven't actually just you didn't leave. That so you didn't leave. He didn't desert, he just never left. But uh, So he eventually caught up to his platoon anyway and was the, the, the charge was dropped. Uh, he didn't see any um, military action and then he came back and was able to resume his studies. So in those days, seminary was kind of set, was set up differently. You spent a lot of time with a parish priest and you, you kind of learned with him as opposed to all piling into one building called a seminary. So the, 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 the formation was... Uh, much more personal, if you will. And his, his tutor recognized he's a guy of great piety, but really struggles academically. So anyway, through jigs and the reels, he gets, he gets through his seminary and he's ordained. And again, look, he's a, he's a, bit, a bit on the simple side of things, so we won't give him anything too demanding. So he was, uh, he was a, a curate for a while in Ecoli. He was born ne near Lyon, by the way. Mar so he was sent to Ecoli, and then eventually uh, sent as parish priest to Ars. Why, why to Ars? Because it had a population of 230, that's why. There was no one there, right? So you can send this, this simple little priest to this simple little village, and what harm can he possibly do? Look, I'm sure he'll be grand. So we sent him off. And, uh, so he's making his way to, to Ars. There's a famous statue on the way in <coughs> to Ars. And uh, it's a statue of the Curie Bar standing and, and, a, and a little boy in front of him. And legend has it that St. Jean Vianney says to the child, <coughs> show me the way to Ars <coughs> and I'll show you the way to heaven. And so you see the boy uh, you, see, you see the boy pointing in the, the statue, the, the boy is pointing the way to ours. Show me the way to ours and I'll show you the way to heaven. So he gets to ours and they're full of zeal and enthusiasm and love for the Lord and love for the Eucharist and love for the Holy Mass uh, with a real disinterest in what people actually think of him. Just absolutely didn't care <laughs> what, uh, about, about human opinion of him. It just didn't matter to him. So he set about um, praying and confessing and converting. Okay, but what I love about the story, and it's not it's told very often actually in the accounts of the saint, is that initially he had zero success. None. So he's a saint. 
in a parish, a small parish, but they were a rural parish, and so like farming ruled, like everything was about farming. So they would work on Sundays. They would, you know, uh, threshing season or, or harvest season was just was 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 crazy. So people didn't go to mass. Uh, on in the autumn because they were too busy cutting hay or over the summer and, and, and autumn between cutting hay and harvesting crops and then when all the money came in they'd spend the nights in the taverns so he, he went to this village small and all as it was uh, it was it was in a bad way morally it was in a bad way so he would spend hours in the chapel on his own so in this parish church in ours, he'd be there kneeling down in front of the Blessed Sacrament, exposed on the altar, on his own, for years. And I think it was, I think it was about six years. I, I couldn't actually find it this morning. I know I read it years ago. I, can't, I couldn't find it this morning. Uh, but I think it was six years into his ministry in ours with very, very little success. And then one particular night, he's there kneeling in front of the Blessed Sacrament, kneeling in front of the altar. And he's just, he's, he's just immersed in prayer. And he's saying, Lord... I pray for these people. Now, in the meantime, one of the guys kind of somewhat stumbled in from one of the bars, just to kind of, he saw the lights on, you know, the candles on uh, in, in, in the chapel. So, uh, so he comes in just to see, to see what's going on. So he just kind of peeks in and he sees the fervor of this man kneeling in front of the altar as he prays. Lord, give me their souls. I am willing to take upon myself any sacrifice but give me their souls and so then the man stumbles back to the tavern and says lads in, in French of course uh, lads we have a holy priest here we have a holy curé and then people start coming back to mass and people start coming back to confession people start coming back to, to the sacraments and it was, but it was all like his this simple instrument in God's hand, which in, in the eyes of human eyes shouldn't have been successful, starts to gain enormous momentum very, very quickly. And now people start coming from all around and, and, and realize that in, in confession there's something different going on here. When he speaks to you, it's like he, it's like he knows your soul. He's able to just speak right into your life. And it's not that confession has to take forever. It's just in those few sentences, he's able to cut right to the chase and speak to, to you as if he knew you all of your life. And so the number of confessions and the hours of confessions <clears throat> would increase and increase, 11 or 12 hours in the winter, up to 16 hours in the summer. Uh, it was just incredible. Like, he, he, to this day, on the way into the confessional in ours, the, it, it's, there's a wooden kind of a kneeler, and it's worn down, you know, it, it deliber deliberately preserved that way now. Uh, after the, the, the years of him hearing confessions there. But just phenomenal. And in, in, his, in his preaching, his preaching was generally quite tender and generally he preferred to focus on the beauty of virtue rather than the heinousness of, of, of vice. But on occasion, like, he'd be very, very clear as well, saying cert, like, all cultures have certain expressions uh, that are blasphemous. We're, we're terrible for it in Ireland for using the Lord's name. For, in other cultures, they use Our Lady's name. Uh, so he would say, like, sorry, these words, inappropriate, never use them. They will drag you to hell. That's how he'd phrase it, like, you know, something goes wrong and you say, uh, we don't say it in English, like, but uh, well, in English we have the kind of, oh, Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, you know. You say, that you say this kind of thing, those words will drag you to hell. That's how he phrased it. And, you know, so he had this really kind of, well, I suppose he's speaking to kind of farmers as well, so it's just, they understand bricks and mortar, black and white, plow the ground. So it's just, he laid it out bluntly in a language they could understand, and they got it. And so people would come then from all around to, 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 spend, to hear him, to go to confession to him. But he's, he's a very practical man as well. He sees the poverty of some people when crops fail or big families and then uh, maybe the father dies and then this, uh, how will they be supported that there isn't a social welfare system again you're in France after the revolution it's not all very straightforward uh, so he sets up a, an orphanage as well with two, two ladies and uh, La Providence the, the Providence it's called so uh, he would set up this house to, to feed the, the needy children in the village and, uh, and to, to house them 
and it's, the house was called Providence. And that's what he wanted to live from. So I'm not sure if there was state aid at the time. Probably not. But he said the Lord will always provide for our needs. And so on, there were so many occasions where they knew the grain store up in the loft was empty. But now three or four children arrive. And then just he would, he would pray and he said, Lord, you brought them to me. Show them that you're father. Provide. And then they'd go up and there'd be just enough grain left for the next meal or just, you know, make a couple of loaves. There was, like, the Lord always provided. It was just like this, this, this continuous miracle of providence. Again, due to, due to their faith. He was a man also who, because he knew that uh, the conversion of souls as such comes at, at, at a price, as in, uh, as priests, you're supposed to unite yourself to the sacrifice of Christ as well. So not just speak about the Lord who sacrifices himself, but become like the Lord who sacrifices himself. Uh, he would fast quite a lot. It's said that he would cook a, or boil a pot of potatoes at the beginning of the week and have one or two a day every day after that, nice and cold. So he wasn't vegan, but um, tendencies, I suppose. <laughs> but fairly, fairly, fairly frugal at best. I mean, food wasn't his thing. And as you can tell from all the statues and the St. Louis windows of him as well, like, he's quite a gaunt character. Uh, <clears throat> but such was his, his, his zeal for souls. And similarly to, to Padre Pio, at times when there would be a so-called big fish the following day, so, you know, a, a, a conversion of, of someone who had very much fallen into sin and who would be like an, an influ a modern, what we call them today, maybe an influencer, you know, so a, a, a big fish who would be arriving the following day, the day before, he would often experience uh, attacks of the enemy, attacks of, of, of manifestations of, of, of evil. Um, and uh, how, how did he phrase it? He said, the enemy, he had, he had a nickname for him. He said, the enemy is closer to me than my ribs. <laughs> like, he's right here. He's right here. Uh, but it's, like, it's, such, it's not that he, you know, you, you, you never um, make light of, of, of the enemy because it, 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 it is a serious thing. But you, we always know God is greater. God is greater. On one occasion, he was accused of fathering a child with one of his spiritual daughters. Uh, so things weren't always easy for him. And how do you, I mean, there weren't DNA tests back then, so... How do you prove your innocence? So he actually remained silent on the issue. And it was, it, was, it was a number of months, maybe even a year, before the actual father of the child came forward and said, no, it wasn't, it wasn't our parish priest, it was me. Uh, again, it wasn't all plain sailing. A lot of other priests, seeing the success of the Curie of ours, said, sorry, who, who, who is this guy that everyone is going to confession to? I mean, his Latin is horrific. Uh, and he was, you know, his, his studies were awful. Why are people going to him for advice? And the, so they started a, a petition to get him removed, which he signed as well. <laughs> <laughs> so the petition was, you know, he's, this guy is, you know, unable, deficient, insufficient. Uh, the said, yep, <laughs> and signs his own name, you know. And the bishop saw it and I suppose took it with a bit of humor, like, I mean, I mean, he's doing no harm, he's doing no wrong, so what's the problem? You know, it was just interesting to see how uh, not everyone reacts. Just because someone is a saint, not everyone reacts graciously. So he's a wonderful example for all priests, not because he was super intelligent and super gifted and all of these things, but because of his zeal, because of his love for the Lord. And so he, <clears throat> like that child in the miracle of the, the, the loaves and the fish, he gives the little he has. And the Lord, the great multiplier, turns that, simple, small, apparently insignificant gift into a miracle and feeds the 5,000. And so it is with us. It, it, it hasn't changed. We're not anything special, but we present what we have, little and limited and all as it may be, to the Lord. And then he can work miracles through it. He can like save souls for all eternity, even through us. Absolutely incredible. So we thank the Lord for the great privilege of serving him. And we ask that St. John Vianney will be a great example and intercessor for, <coughs> for all priests, that they may discover or rediscover the, the zeal 
and the love which we pray so called to have for all of our people. Amen.